Welcome everybody to our presentation on the principle of creation. We want to try to understand a little bit about life in the universe. People generally have a lot of questions about life and really want to understand the meaning of their life and where they're going. But you know, one thing that we have to understand is the principle behind humanity and the universe. And that's the key. A good analogy would be like the Wright brothers who were able to fly at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Before they could do that, many people had tried, many people had attempted to fly. But it wasn't until the principle of flight, the principle of aerodynamics was finally applied correctly could they actually fly. There's a very deep lesson there. Likewise, we're searching for the meaning of our life and how we relate to all things in the universe. We have to understand the principle behind the universe, behind the creation of humanity. Inevitably, that leads us to the causal reality of life in the universe. And we refer to that causal reality as God. You know, um, many people have taken surveys. The question, do you believe in God, is often answered affirmatively. That, uh, oh, of course I believe in God. But we're not just talking about believing in God. That's the easy part. The most important part, and sometimes the most challenging part, is what is your relationship with God? What's the nature of our relationship with God? If we find out that God is just a force field, an energy source, well that's going to pretty well determine the type of relationship that we have with God. However, if we're able to discover within God a certain emotional content, a consciousness, a heart, uh, then likewise that's going to de determine greatly the nature of our relationship with that kind of God and we would look towards more of an intimate relationship with that God. These are some of the things that we want to explore in the principle of creation and we're really going to start with trying to understand the dual characteristics of God, the nature of God. That's our focus. We're going to start by understanding how God is, what God is and and how that dictates the nature of our relationship with God. What can we say about God? How can we know the invisible nature of God? That's what this question is asking. How can we know the nature of God? Isn't that a beautiful scene? That's actually um, Lake Tahoe in Nevada. Beautiful. And what this really implies is something that also St. Paul mentioned in Romans 1.20. I'd like to just share with you what he said. He said, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from the things that he has made. So that men are without excuse. What's Paul talking about here? He's saying essentially that yes, God is invisible. And because God is invisible, that's why many people, as an excuse, say that, hey, I, God is irrelevant. You're talking invisible. So I don't believe in God because of that invisible nature of God. But Paul is saying that's not an excuse. Because though God is invisible, he has manifested himself in a very visible form. And so God's nature is made manifest in the things that he has created. That would be just like an artist revealing himself in his artwork. This is Vincent van Gogh. And of course, Vincent van Gogh lived a very long time ago. We never met Vincent van Gogh. And yet, he left behind a lot of, of his artwork. And we can look at his artwork, and we can understand many things about Vincent van Gogh. Because 
The artwork is visible. It is the expression of the artist. The artist, in a sense, is invisible, and um, in that maybe I've never met the artist, but the artist is expressed, and I can know the artist's dreams, his hopes, his struggles, his despairs, in his visible manifestation. Well, that's the foundation to be able to understand what Paul is saying about God. God is invisible, he has an invisible nature, but that invisible nature is visibly manifested in the creation. And that's what Romans 1.20 is talking about. Thus, for our purposes today, if we examine the common elements within the creation and uh, you know, assess all the, the common components of the creation, we can understand, well, the core common element of all things in the entire universe is the nature of God, that the nature of God is expressed commonly as the common center and is manifested in all things in the same way. And thus, if we can extrapolate it, that common characteristic as we examine a, a wide array, a wide spectrum of, of existence, we can understand, well, that must be the visible manifestation of God. That's exciting. That's really exciting. We can see the fingerprint of God upon the universe. And that's what we want to look at. And if we were to really simplify this, and that's what we're going to do, because we really don't have uh, a whole lot of time. But you know what? Simplicity and complexity actually work together. Uh, we could be infinitely complex, but we can also look at things simply and still reach the profound. So we're going to be simple here. We're going to look at the simple, um, common element within the universe. And, and what we see is the pair system. That all of creation exists in pairs. Isn't that fascinating? Haven't you ever noticed that? That it seems like everything reflects this basic structure of plus and minus, day and night, in and out, up and down. For example, the, the smallest uh, thing in the creation reflecting what we would refer to as the image of God, male and female, man and woman, which is rendered in Genesis 1.27, that man and woman are described as the image of God. So that pair system is something that indeed reflects the very existence of God himself. And so when he imparts himself upon the creation, whether it be an atom, where we see uh, electrons spinning around the center, or plants, where we see stamen and pistol interacting in uh, uh, the existence and multiplication of plants, or the male and female structure of animals, or getting back to our human level, man and woman, from the most basic unit matter, a unit of matter to the most complex, we see this fundamental common element in the creation, that everything is existing within this pair system. And the Bible tells us, well, that's the very image of God. So this really gives us a window into understanding more about the nature of God. Let's go there. Let's open that window and see what we can see. So um, let's delve a little bit more deeply into this pair system. And, and if basically what we're saying is that enti any entity, anything that exists, is going to manifest in dual characteristics or in the pair system mode. And uh, we might borrow a little bit from uh, um, Eastern philosophy, uh, the philosophy of yin and yang, uh, positive and negative. Now, many times we're, we um, try to think of good examples that illustrate this. And one that I can think of is, um, let's think of sports. Let's think of uh, basketball, uh, for example. What would be an example of uh, yin basketball and 
Yang basketball. Well, in a basketball game you have offense and defense. That's positive, negative. Two sides at once. And so either you're playing offense or you're playing defense. But the game is uh, bearing these two components. Uh, but also we see a more deeper type of dual characteristic in all things. And that is the dual characteristics of outer form and inner quality. Outer form and inner quality or internal nature and external form. Everything that exists has an inner invisible nature and a visible external form. And uh, that is a much more fundamental dual characteristic in terms of a person. You would think of uh, personality and body or mind and body relationship. And those two relate together as one. Uh, if we go back to our basketball analogy, uh, it would be um, uh, the internal nature of basketball would be the game plan. Got to have a game plan. And the external form would be the execution of that game plan. So that's the uh, external nature, external form of the game. The internal nature is the game plan. Uh, so this, uh, this um, structure and functioning uh, is the foundation of everything in the creation. And thus, we can extrapolate that back towards the first uh, cause, towards the very existence of God. And we can conclude that that system must come from God. And as we've already seen in Genesis, chapter 1, verse 27, that male and female are the image of God, we could say that positive and negativity, original yang, original yin, uh, originate within God. And God's dual characteristics of yin and yang, positive and negative, male and female, really serve as the archetype and the standard of all positive and negative relationships in the creation. Um, and also related to God then, this second type of dual characteristics of internal nature and external form is something that originates in God. So what is the uh, original form of God? Well, God doesn't have a physical body as we know. The Bible points to God in John 4 and 24 as being spirit. God is a spirit. And um, so in terms of God's container or his form, we would say that God is a spiritual being. Well, there are many kinds of spiritual beings. There's angels, there's uh, uh, people in the spiritual world. Uh, many types of spiritual beings. But when we talk about God's essential nature, we've got to transcend the external form. We've got to go deeper to really touch the essence of God. And so we then enter into the internal nature of God. And that's where, biblically, we go to the First John chapter 4, verse 16, that God is love. So God is spirit which would be more of the container, the vehicle, the mode of God's expression and activity. And God is spirit, or rather God is love, is more a manifestation of God's inner nature uh, and his consciousness. So ultimately, as Jesus referred to God as Father, it's really a heartistic, a loving identification which stands as the, uh, the essence of God's internal nature um, in his dual characteristics of nature and form. Well, we got a mess of dual characteristics. How do they work together? Uh, one thing that we know in Mark 12, 29 is that God is one, that God is not divided. God is not separate within himself, but he is one. He is harmonized. And so when we look at God's, uh, dual characteristics, for example, his uh, dual characteristics of um, his original internal nature and his original external form, we would say that that's the most essential manifestation of God. And then out of his internal nature 
comes the dual characteristics of yin and yang, male and female. So we could say that uh, masculine and feminine nature originates in God and masculine and feminine form originates in God. The essence is the dual characteristics of internal nature and external form. Out of that come the dual characteristics of yin and yang. But all of these within God are harmonized and are one. God is one. So God's dual characteristics are not separate things, but they are harmonized to form one existence that we know is God. And here's our biblical references. God is spirit in John 4.24 and God is love in 1 John 4.16. The essence of God is love. And therefore we can see that we're moving towards the idea that the nature of our relationship with God is going to be one of intimacy, tenderness, and a very personal relationship with God. Because in God's internal original internal nature is beating the heart of a loving parent. God is one. Mark 12, 29. So as a God of oneness who has created via the same principle of his own existence, then we could say everything in the creation all dual characteristics by which everything is created is ultimately seeking to come into a state of being that reflects the archetype God. God is like the template of what all pairs should do and, what all, and how all pairs should function. So as a result we see that between God and creation there is a reflection which again touches on what Paul has said in Romans 1.20. Why does the creation reflect God? You know, why is there a resonance between God and the creation? It's because the creation is existing via the same principle by which God himself is existing. God is very efficient, very intelligent. When he created, he didn't have to think up a new principle by which to create. Basically, he resourced himself. He examined himself and he said, hey, I, I exist pretty good. And uh, what is the principle by which I exist? Well, you know, it's this pair system and, and uh, plus and minus and male and female and subject and object and they're harmonized in, in the oneness. I think this works. And so rather than thinking up some new principle by which to create, God merely applied, I say merely, he, he applied his own life existence principle to the creation. So the principle of creation is the principle by which God exists. And that's why God and the creation reflect one another because they are operating and existing and thriving and multiplying and developing via the same, very same principle. Look, this is what um, the first chapter of John means. When it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the universe was made through the Word, and that the Word became flesh. That's what that means. God isn't using a separate word or principle, but he's using his very own life word. And that's why later Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. That word has life, because that word is the template by which God himself is existing. That's why Romans 1.20 works, because... We see the visible image of God in the things that he has created. And most essentially, we see that image in the relationship of man and woman. That's why God created Adam and Eve. And we see that Jesus, 
really nails it here. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. And for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And here's the key point. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but are one. They're no longer two, but one. Stop being two. And they became one. There was a transformation. This is touching on the magic when two harmonize and become one. As a matter of fact, throughout the Bible, whenever the term one is used, it automatically implies the relationship and harmonization of two. For example, when Jesus said that all believers are to be one as God and Christ are one. So two become one. So the idea of one doesn't mean single, but it's suggesting two positions attracting, interacting, harmonizing, and ascending to a position where in fact they are no longer two, but they achieve a new status of oneness. And that indeed is the purpose of the relationship of man and woman in marriage. That's the plan of God. Let's uh, go a little bit deeper in this and let's talk about this four position foundation and this process of harmonization which we would call give and take action. We want to understand what, what is the process by which two become one. And uh, not only is this uh, relevant for husbands and wives, but it's relevant for everything that we do. Because everything, every activity in life involves the interaction between two, subject and object. No matter what we do, whether it's our mind and body, whether it's me and my work, um, me and my automobile, there is an interaction, a give and take, and a harmony that must be achieved. Let's take a look at that. Uh, the idea of give and take action. We know that God is the creator. And that God created via the word. And by that we mean God is the template of all existence. Because God is the template, then when God creates... He manifests his plus and minus, remember, his dual characteristics, are manifested when he creates. So we could call that subject and object. Subject and object can be any type of manifestation of dual characteristics, positive and negative, in and out, night and day, or here, red and blue. Red and blue are very interesting colors. Red and blue engage in a subject-object relationship. And then they blend. And when they blend, they form a new color. And that new color we call purple. Want to see that again? Subject and object. Now, here's one of the mysteries. What causes plus and minus to attract to one another? To merge and to become one. There's some kind of force of attraction. There's some kind of basis that causes a plus and minus particle to come together. There's some common base or common need, for example, between molecules the common need for a certain amount of electrons spinning around the nucleus that attracts molecules to join together and to complete each other like Jerry Maguire. It's really quite a phenomenon. And what it is, is that within subject and object is something in common. Something in common. And having something in common is what causes them to attract and gives them the foundation to be able 
to engage one another. Have you ever had a conversation with someone that you didn't know? What is it that you do? Think about it. You talk about the weather, or you try to find some common point of interest. You talk about the baseball team, or if it's football season, you talk about the local team. And whenever you score a hit on some point of common interest, then the give and take action starts. When you finally discover something you both know, or you have a mutual friend or a mutual interest, then the engagement takes place. The give and take starts happening, and then the forces take over, and a relationship develops. Well, that's how give and take action happens. Subject and object have something in common. And what is it that they have in common? You know what it is? It's the template. The template from which they were formed. And where is that template? That template is in God, the archetype. Again, remember God is one. God is the origin, not just of all things, but he is also the origin of the, the principle by which all things are existing and acting and functioning and developing. So plus and minus attract one another because they both come from this original template who is the harmonized center, is the archetype of what all dual characteristics should be. God is harmonized. So therefore, plus and minus on, uh, in the creation will likewise form a union that reflects the original template. So when plus and minus become one, a union is formed. And as Jesus said, so they're, they're no longer two, but they're one. Now this union, if it's a union of plus and minus, or if it's the union of red and blue, or if it's the union of man and woman, it's something very magical and mysterious. Because what happens when the union appears is that there is a transformation of sort. It's a phenomena of one plus one becomes three. Red and blue merge and magenta appears. So you have red, blue, and three. Magenta. One plus one is three. Whew! That's amazing. Elements come together in the natural world. Sodium and chlorine come together and form salt. Salt is unique from sodium and chloride. Very, very unique. There's so many examples you can think of. How about, look at yourself in the mirror. You look a little bit like your dad. You look a little bit like your mom. But you also look unique, like yourself. Mom, dad, yourself. That's three. We're all three in one. And so the union, when the union is formed, somehow it achieves a status of being, a value greater than the sum of of the two parts and that is really the magic of the process of harmony. Or if we go back to my analogy about a sports team, you know a sports team that uh, has got a good offense and a good defense and it's got a good game plan and it executes is a team that has what do you call it momentum or or chemistry they can be another team that may have superior athletes by having greater team cohesiveness and chemistry. And that magical force of chemistry is achieved by union, by the union. So this is a status of being that is very desirable and we want to get there. And also when the union is formed, it forms a vertical axis with God. So that God is able to be imbued into the union. And that's really where the chemistry, the momentum comes from. Even in terms of sports, God blesses the union with a greater power, with a greater spirit, and with 
a greater tendency to bring about our dreams and our hopes. That's what happens in this four position foundation. So also in the four position foundation, God can have give and take action with the object, with the union, and with the subject, which we would call triple objective purpose. So, of course, this is a flat surface, and uh, dimensionally it's not really a correct rendering, because really we're talking about spherical mo motion in the creation that when all positions are engaged with God in the four position foundation and give and take action horizontally and vertically is taking place and triple objective purpose is being manifested what you actually have is spherical motion as the core or fundamental manifestation of the archetype of God of the the template spherical motion then really stands as the image manifestation of God and as a result all things in the creation reflect this type of uh, spherical structure whether it's the basic unit of matter like an atom or we go out in the uh, a little bit into the cosmos into the solar system I used to always notice the solar system kind of looks like an atom, doesn't it? Same structure, same principle, same forms. Uh, we can go out even a, a little farther into the cosmos and we can find uh, spiral galaxies where again the center is established and there's turning motion around the center. It's a fundamental movement that is manifesting God's life principle. You know, uh, if you look at a hurricane, high pressure, low pressure, meet, turning motion, and then the eye of the hurricane appears. The center disappears, which suggests a vertical motion. Uh, you flush the toilet and watch the water go around, and a vertical line appears wherever there is this circular or turning motion. That's the fundamental structure and movement of the four position foundation and give and take action. And at the center of this movement is God. The ultimate center and causal being of the universe. So yes, God is invisible but I think he's becoming more visible, isn't he? Everywhere you turn, you can see the fingerprint of God. And the more that we examine that fingerprint, we'll discover that his deepest expression is manifested in the simple words, I love you, for God is love. And so, it is within God's image then that this feeling, this ideal of love was to be magnified and, and substantiated. Adam and Eve were to be the recipients of God's love and then were to embody it in a loving relationship of husband and wife and expand that to a family, society, nation and world. We, we see it reflected in the scripture. For example, in Ephesians 5.33, Paul says that every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is talking about give and take action. And husband, you've got to give first. It's not take and give action. And it's not you give and I'll take action. No, it's you give first. And um, when we can give first and initiate the giving, then we initiate the response. And it's really like a starter motor starting a car on a very cold morning. So we have to initiate love 
for there to be give and take action. And uh, man and woman naturally seem to attract to one another. And of course, we understand now that the common base between man and woman is the existence of God, that God is the template, that God is one and created man and woman in his image. But God isn't divided, he is one. So the archetype or template of marriage is something that is implicit within God. That's why marriage isn't a human invention, but it's something that is uh, fundamentally uh, a part of God as the Word. And when we say the Word, uh, the ideal of marriage is an integral part of that Word that was with God and is God. And so uh, this is why we see then that God has instructed that man and woman interact and become one. What is the virtue that brings two into one? What is that virtue? We have to turn the wheel. We have to turn the wheel in a relationship before a vertical line will appear. We have to turn the wheel. You see, that's why 1 John 4, 16 says that God is love. And he who lives in love then lives in God and God in him. You see that? The horizontal and the vertical. He who lives in love is turning the wheel. And when the wheel turns, then the vertical line appears. He lives in God and God in him. That's how it works. And it's like a gyroscope. You know, there, uh, this gyroscope is balanced and uh, this gyroscope over here is not balanced. And if you were to try to balance this by just taking the tip of it and trying to balance it, it would be impossible. And you would decide, man, to balance a gyroscope is whew, difficult. Well, this is like a marriage without turning the wheel. And what is turning the wheel? It's exercising that virtue of living for others. Like Paul said in 533 of Ephesians, husbands, love. Make the decision. Make the decision. Paul says that all grace will abound to the one who decides in his heart. And here's the thing. Love starts as a decision. Did you hear what I said? Because, you know, in our world, our modern secular world, we really operate under the delusion that love starts as an emotion or a feeling. But in truth, the life of love begins by a decision. A decision to act a decision to subscribe to a certain virtue which Christ many times talked about. He was articulating it when he said, give up your life and you'll gain your life. It's a decision. He was talking about it when he said, when he said, think first of the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness and then all things will be added unto you. You notice something about that? Is that it always begins with you first decide to give and then the universe will respond. Husbands, love your wife and she'll respond. Think first of the kingdom and all things will be added unto you. Give up your life and then you will gain. That's the virtue that brings two into one. And the challenge about that virtue is that first you got to turn the wheel before the love and the feeling, the, and I'm talking about the real love and the real feeling, which is the love and feeling that never ends. That's the real one. You got to turn the wheel to bring that love into our life. And without God, it doesn't happen because guess what? He's the one, he's the one that has that kind of love. 
So when we live in love, make the decision to live in love, we live in God and God in us. That's the key to everlasting life, love, and relationship. Let's touch on a, an important point here um, related to Adam and Eve. You know, God told Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.28, um, he gave them the three blessings we see. He told them to be fruitful, multiply, and then fill the earth and have dominion over it. So there's a certain priority here with Adam and Eve. Notice he didn't say multiply and then be fruitful whenever you can. No. It starts out clearly, be fruitful, then multiply, and then dominion will be established. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the three blessings that God has given to Adam and Eve. And we want to describe these clearly because they're really the model for a true and perfect human society that God was imparting to his son and daughter, which unfortunately, as we obviously can see, they did not heed. What does it mean to be fruitful? Well, this is talking about first um, uh, spirit and body relationship. Remember? we got to get back to the dual characteristics principle. So we are created uh, as man and women, man and woman, manifestation of dual characteristics, but individually is where we see the most essential dual characteristic of spirit and body, mind and body, internal and external. So before man and woman can become one, first they must be fruitful. And you know what this is? This is like the um, uh, marriage of your mind and body. There has to be an internal marriage before the external marriage between man and woman can take place. So the first blessing means individual perfection, the unity of spirit and body, and then on that established integrity, the unity of perfected man and woman. So the unity of perfected man and woman means that Adam and Eve could stand as true parents. And true parents means that when Adam and Eve came together as husband and wife, uh, they would give birth to children that would be God's own descendants, God's direct descendants. And that would be the foundation of sovereignty and dominion. That through an expanding lineage, God would exercise an eternal sovereignty upon the earth and in spirit. So to be fruitful, Adam and Eve would have to go through what we call a growing period. Just like we see in the uh, natural world. Um, a tree, an apple tree, has to go through three stages of growth. A formation, growth, and completion stage. And when it achieves perfection, that's when it bears fruit, which bears the seed of the next generation. So likewise, in a similar way, um, when we think in terms of the first blessing, that's really what Adam and Eve had to achieve as a prerequisite to be able to multiply, to be able to stand as husband and wife, to enter into the relationship as husband and wife. First, they would have to be fruitful. Now there's any number of ways you can understand what that means. Uh, I like what Jesus said in Matthew 5.48, that we must be perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect. And if we go to the uh, New Testament Greek, telos uh, would mean perfect or mature, complete. So Adam and Eve in the first blessing have to become mature and complete. What does it mean essentially? In 1 John 4.12 it says, If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and, and here's the key, His love is perfected in us. So God has placed this capacity to love as God loves. That's why Jesus implored us not only just to receive this love but actually to return love to God and to love God with all our heart. Uh, what kind of love is God worthy of? Well he's worthy of perfected love. 
And that's our job. That's the job of Adam and Eve is before they join together as husband and wife, that they perfect this capacity to love which God has given them. And how would they uh, accomplish that? One well, a very uh, fundamental way. God put the fruit in front of them. And then he introduced them to a very amazing word. And it was the word no. Don't eat it. Now what's going on there? In uh, our presentation on the fall of man, we're going to go very in depth into the meaning of the fruit. But for our uh, uh, purpose uh, in this presentation, let's just say it's something that their body really desired. Somehow we could say it represents their carnal desire. Something that the flesh wants. Now God is introducing the word no to Adam and Eve. You have to say no to your body. This is a very deep principle. What is it that God wants Adam and Eve to achieve? He wants them to achieve and inherit his capacity to love, as we just saw in uh, 1 John 4 and 12, that, that God has placed his love within us, and we are supposed to perfect that love. So how do we do that? What's the process? Well, think about everything in creation. Everything in creation is controlled by natural law. But we know that God, in essence, is not natural law. He is love. So Adam and Eve have to transcend the realm of natural law in order to enter into a love relationship with God. How do they transcend the realm of natural law? There's only one way. Say no to the body. Their body represents the entire natural world. So as Adam and Eve transcend their body, then they transcend the limit of natural law. And as they do so, they enter into the realm of love. That's why any civilization that introduced the principle of, of premarital abstinence, requiring men and women to say no to their carnal desire, it also was a civilization that where love in marriage would emerge. So there is a relationship between the idea of premarital abstinence and love, commitment within marriage. Very direct relationship. So God wants them to transcend natural law and he gives them the authority to do that. Because think about it, your body is very adamant, very determined. It's not going to listen to no unless you are authorized by God with that power. So God gives them the commandment and then really ignites this capacity to have faith. So by giving them the capacity, this is like pushing a, a, a baby bird out of the nest. That's what really instigates the, the baby bird's effort to fly. That's where the baby bird really puts into use this innate capacity to fly. And this is exactly what God is doing. Adam and Eve have this innate capacity to have faith and God ignites it by placing them in a position where they have to say no to their body and not having the natural strength or authority to do that, they have to uh, awaken this capacity of faith in God's Word and then exercise this newfound strength. After all, the power of faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. And so by exercising this faith, then they enter into a life of self-discipline, self government, self-control. Paul tells us that when we control our bodies, avoid sexual immorality, that is the pathway to sanctification, which means that God indwells in us on the foundation of 
how we exercise this discipline over ourselves, control our bodies. That's the key to premarital preparation. It is the key to be able to enter into a marriage with the full power of love and the full readiness to make a full commitment to my spouse. This is what God is setting up in the Garden of Eden. This is what this process is. So this period to exercise responsibility, faith in God's Word, we could call the indirect dominion or the conditional period of relationship with God, meaning that Adam and Eve have to keep faith. They have to produce that condition of faith in order to maintain a relationship with God. And if they are successful in fulfilling that responsibility, they will then later, in perfection, enter the direct dominion of God where their relationship with God will be impervious to any kind of interruption will be eternal and absolute this is the perfection realm and this is where their marriage was to begin in this indirect dominion the possibility exists that they could separate from God how if they break faith with his word and don't fulfill their responsibility. So when we study the fall of man later, we're going to really examine closely how well did they fulfill their responsibility. You see, another very important thing to understand is that when God gave them this role, he was sharing his own role as creator with them. In other words, the role of self-government. God is not a totalitarian God. He's actually extending to Adam and Eve this portion of responsibility. We say figuratively 5%. And what is it? It is to exercise control over oneself. God has given us that unique responsibility. And by exercising that responsibility, we say that then God's will 100% is fulfilled. We play a real role. God is not a do-it-all-for-you God. We have to play, and Adam and Eve had to play, a real substantial role. And what is that role? That role is as co-creator. So in that respect, God creates mind and body. Adam and Eve got to unite their mind and body. God creates man and woman. Adam and Eve have got to accomplish the relationship. So God creates the parts. That's his 95%. But our 5% is through faith, obedience to his word, exercising uh, responsibility and dominion over our body, disciplining ourselves. We establish a realm of freedom where our hearts can receive the capacity to love, we can give love, and most importantly, we can grow in love. And that's really the meaning of the first blessing, is to achieve the standard of a true person, which is to establish myself as a person of true love and integrity. During this time, we're to flee from sexual immorality which remains as a standard through all time. In 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and verse 18, Paul lays it down clear, doesn't he? He says, flee from sexual immorality. Oh, look at this, all other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So truly, it's very important, purity before marriage, abstinence, before marriage. Uh, that's not a, a, a recent uh, conclusion, but this has been a standard since the beginning. And that brings us to the ultimate purpose of purity before marriage. It means that had Adam and Eve perfected their love, then they would have entered in their horizontal relationship with the full power of love, which means the full power to become one as God and Christ are one, as God is one. And we also see in Malachi uh, 2.15, God expresses his motive in having Adam and Eve strive towards this ideal 
of becoming one. And what was that? And why should they be one, God says? Because God wanted a godly seed. God wanted his own lineage and wanted Adam and Eve not to be false parents with a false lineage, but to be true parents that produced true lineage, God's direct descendants. So we could say that God uh, opened up the dust and rib factory for a one-time only event and then closed it down. And henceforth, his clear intention was that his lineage, his sons and daughters, would be a co-creation between God in partnership with man. And there lies the original sacredness of marriage. That really we enter into a partnership with God to be husband and wife, to build a family, to make substantial all the loves of God, and most importantly, to make substantial his very own lineage. We partnership with God in the birth, not just of our children, but in the birth of his sons and daughter. And therein lies the original value of marriage. So on the foundation of that multiplication, we see the expansion of God's sovereignty through his lineage. That was the original plan. That God's sovereignty would be uh, an expanding sovereignty as his lineage expanded from this first family, expanding to a tribe, to a society, to a nation, to a world forever and ever. His kingdom would be upon the earth. And uh, not only would uh, people be able to say, as you see me, you see the Father, but they would be able to say, as you see the family, you see God. As you see the society, you would see God. As you see the world, you would see God. That was his purpose and motive and plan for creation. And so, obviously, it didn't happen. We see quite a different world than a world that really manifests, at least in the human society, that which is God. We see God in the natural world. We see God when we sit on the uh, hillside, mountainside in Lake Tahoe. But we don't see God as much in our human world. Instead, we see violence, suffering, hatred, hunger, inhumanity, violence, war, bloodshed, somehow we got separated as the perfect representation of God. And we find out that in fact God lost his lineage in the beginning. In Genesis 6.6 6, it says that the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain, sorrow. He grieved. Because Adam and Eve fell away from him. Adam and Eve didn't carry out his will, his plan. And instead their lineage, rather than being a lineage of life, rather than being the vehicle of God's sovereignty, became instead the vehicle of Satan's sovereignty. Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. And uh, we've seen that in the death of one man is death for all. This has been the historical legacy of sin. And this has been the tragedy that has taken place since the fall. We're going to study this a little bit more in our presentation on the fall of man. Uh, we're going to take a break now and uh, I want to thank you for uh, being with us and watching this presentation and uh, I hope you'll stick around and watch part two of the principle of creation where we'll take a look at the invisible substantial world and the visible substantial world. We're going to talk about the spirit world and I think uh, the issue of what happens when you die is one that is very important and very interesting. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll stick around and watch the next presentation. Thank you. God bless you.